Well, let me see if I can remember how to do this. Um, oh, yeah, take a copy of the Bible and turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to be in verses 1 through 7 this morning when the question was asked for this series, what are the standards of church leadership? I thought, well, I'll just tackle elders and deacons together until I tried. Uh, so we are not going to do that. We're going to turn this into two questions, one on elders and one on deacons. And this morning it's going to be on elders. Now, as Paul traveled throughout the Mediterranean world on what we call his missionary journeys throughout uh, the, all around, uh, he was engaged in the apostolic work of planting new churches in the cities that he visited. And those churches that he planted are what we call today planted pregnant. In other words, they were planted ready to plant more churches in the area surrounding that place. And that was Paul's intention. Well, some of what Paul did too is he would leave some of his associates or send some of his associates into these areas where new churches were being planted to help establish them, to help build their structure. And part of that included the appointment of elders and deacons in each one of these churches. The letters to Timothy and Titus provide us with God's vision for the leadership structure of his church. Now, over the years, many layers and hierarchies have been added to it by the traditions of men, but they are not found in Scripture. What we find in Scripture is what I believe the Baptist faith holds to, and that is the local church with elders and deacons under the headship of Christ with no other hierarchy beyond it. That is what we see in Scripture with a congregational polity, and that is what I believe we are to follow today. So as we begin this study of the question of what the standards of church leadership are, we're going to consider the office of elder, and we see the qualifications for that office in chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. So will you stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word this morning? The Apostle Paul, writing to his young protege, Timothy, writes, The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil." Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for giving us these instructions for your church. Father, we pray that we are faithful to them and that we follow them as you have laid them out. We ask that as we study this, we may become strengthened and encouraged about the care that you have for your bride. And Father, may we walk out of here even more thankful for what you have done for us in Jesus' name and by his work. Amen. Amen. Well, throughout the New Testament, elders are identified as the spiritual leadership in the local church. More Now, that term elder is used most frequently in the New Testament to refer to this office, but it is not the only term that is used in the New Testament. In fact, there are three terms referring to the office of elder that we can find in the New Testament. The other terms include overseer, which is the term that we see here in our passage this morning in verse 1, and also pastor. Now, some have asserted through the history of the church that these terms refer to distinct offices. Uh, in fact, sometimes overseer is translated as bishop in the New Testament. 
Uh, it comes from the Greek word episcopus, and it means overseer, but has become bishop. And, and as a result, some traditions, you can think of perhaps the Roman Catholic tradition, has established different hierarchies such as bishops and archbishops and cardinals and popes, all of which you will find nothing about in scripture. You find these three terms. Now these three terms are actually synonymous with each other. They're all describing the same office, just they're describing some different functions of that office. For instance, when we look at the word elder, we see that it refers to the maturity of the person. We're not talking about a physical age. We're not talking about a person who is old. We're talking about somebody who is spiritually mature. For instance, Timothy was left in Ephesus by Paul in order to set the church up in that area. And Paul even writes to him, don't let anyone despise you because of your youth. He knew that Timothy could be looked down upon because he was younger, but Timothy had grown up with a faithful mother, Eunice, and a faithful grandmother, Lois, who had instilled the faith in him from a young age. And as a result, he was old in the faith. He was mature in the faith. Now, second, another term that we see is overseer. And that describes part of the activity of the person, of the elder. And overseer means that they uh, watch over, they keep track of, they monitor, they also make sure things are going the right way. So in other words, it's the leadership aspect. That shows its way in administration in the church. It shows its way in leadership. It shows its way in the ministry direction, the vision of the church, and also looking after the needs of the local church as a whole. Now third, we see the term pastor. And pastor is also translated shepherd. And that describes another aspect of what an elder does in the congregation. He shepherds the flock, which means that he feeds the flock of God. He provides teaching and sustenance from God's word. He also uh, uh, looks after the flock. He's with them through whatever comes. He tends the flock. He cares for the individual members. And this is the term pastor that you hear most often in the church today to describe the office of elder. Uh, most people know me as Pastor Roy. That's, that's part of, of what I do. Now, I say that these are all synonymous. There's actually a passage in Acts 20 where, where all three terms are used to refer to the same office. Luke says that, that Paul gathered the elders of Ephesus. And when he had gathered them, he called them overseers and charged them to pastor the people. See, all three are describing the same office. Now, one more thing I want to share about this. When we look in scripture and it talks about this office as applied in the local church, it's in the plural. It's elders. When you set up elders in a church, and, and what I believe that means is that there's a plurality of elders that are supposed to be in charge of the local church. It's not any one individual, but it is a group of brothers who have been called and equipped by Jesus Christ. And there's great advantage in a plurality of elders. It prevents and guards against abuse by a single elder. It also allows for the wisdom of multiple perspectives and thoughts. There's no need to look outside the local church for teaching in corporate worship if the main pastor is out. There's accountability among the brothers, and there's a sharing of, burden, of the burden of spiritual leadership and shepherding as well. And then there's just a greater balance of gifts. I have certain gifts as a believer in Jesus Christ that the Spirit in his wisdom and according to his good will and pleasure has given me. And they're very different than the, uh, the, the qualities and the gifts that he has given my brother Jason or my brother Kirk or my brother Bob. All of that is a great balance. We are uh, filling in each other. Now, the second office outlined in scripture within the local church is that of deacons. And the deacons are the servants of the church. That's actually what the word deacon means in the Greek is servant. And we're not going to get into them this morning, so we'll leave that for next week. Just understand that that's the second office. But what about other positions? Are there any other positions listed in scripture for officers of the church? Well, no, there isn't. 
But that doesn't mean that there aren't other ministries of the church and that God has not equipped individual believers to serve in those ministries. I'm thinking of things like men's ministry, women's ministry, children's ministry. You can go on and on, fellowship ministry. God has equipped and gifted individuals to serve in those capacities, and it is good and right for them to do so under the leadership of the elders of the church who are the spiritual leaders for the congregation. And so long as those ministries operate under the guidance and direction of the elders, there's no problem. But if you've ever been in a church where different ministries set up their own individual fiefdoms, and you have this group that's fighting this group over here, and the pastor or the elders just can't seem to make any headway, you know how bad that can be. You know how wrong that is, how anti-biblical that is. No, we can certainly have uh, men's ministry directors and things like that, as long as they're not trying to usurp the spiritual authority within the local congregation that rightly and biblically belongs to the elders. You see, when Christ is the head of the church, he appoints elders to provide servant leadership in that local church's context. So with that foundation, let's consider the model for church leadership that we find in the office of elder. Paul goes through here in these seven verses and provides us with numerous qualifications for those who will serve as elders in the church. We see it opening up in this section of his letter when he writes, this saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to, off to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. He desires, he aspires to it. Now, that doesn't mean that anybody can be an elder. It means that there should be a calling, but certainly you respond to that calling, right? When you hear the calling of God, you're going to respond to it and you're going to aspire to this office. And he says it's a noble task. It's a great thing. Leadership in the church is a great thing. It's a, it's a great responsibility, but it does have incredible standards as well. So having said this, he goes on through this list of qualifications, and the first one that we see is that uh, elders are here to be in relationship with God. And what I plan to do as we move through this list is show you four areas of relationship that these qualifications apply to. The first one is in relationship to God, and then also in relationship to the family, in relationship to the self, and then relationship to others. So let's begin here. Now, before we jump in, let me say this. These are high standards. They are. But they're standards that every Christian ought to aspire to. Now, there are a couple such as teaching that not every believer is gifted to do. We understand that. But when you look at these personal qualifications in Scripture, things that we're going to see like respectable and hospitable and uh, thought well of by outsiders, this, this should be every believer. This isn't just elders who have these responsibilities, but it is the elders who have the responsibility to model these qualifications to the rest of the body. So let's consider this. The very first one that we see that is in relationship to God is that an overseer must be above reproach. We see that in verse 2. Now this corresponds to the notion of being blameless that we see over in Titus 1.6. That's the parallel passage to 1 Timothy 3 where he writes to Titus and gives him also a list of qualifications for overseers. It looks a little different, but it's essentially the same. He just writes it in a different way there. Now an elder, by being above reproach, is to have such a character about him, has such integrity about him that any charge of wrongdoing or sinfulness against him would just be almost dismissed out of hand, not because you're not going to investigate it, but because his character, how he lives his life on a daily basis is such that people just would have a hard time believing that. If you had a pastor of a church who day in and day out is ministering to his flock and is serving his community, and then and it doesn't matter who he's, who, he's, he's dealing with everybody, and then somebody comes in and says, he's a racist. Well, if his character 
is being demonstrated, if he's above reproach, it doesn't mean that he'll never be accused of things. It just means those accusations are going to be like water on a duck's back. It's just going to flow right off because his character has demonstrated that he is not like that. Now listen, that doesn't mean that an elder is sinless. That's a mistake some people have, that pastors and elders never sin, never mess up, that once we've been elevated to this position, all that's gone. Well, that's hogwash. We are still human. We still struggle with a sin nature. We do, and we will sin. But the character of an elder is such that he is striving after sanctification. He is wanting to be more and more like Jesus Christ. It doesn't mean that he's not going to slip. It means that he's going to pick himself up and keep going when he does. He's going to seek the forgiveness he has by the grace of God in Jesus Christ, and then he's going to continue imitating Jesus. In other words, the elders walk with Christ must be evident to all. This is an overarching qualification. Now, the next characteristic is found in verse 2. He must be able to teach. It's at the end of that verse. And it's here that there is a crucial distinction for the elder. He must be able to teach. This is not something that is made a requirement of deacons. It's not a requirement of believers. But it is a requirement of elders. Why is that? Well, the reason is because elders are exercising spiritual oversight of the congregation, and they have been charged by Jesus to feed his sheep, to give them sustenance from the word. They must be able to teach. So what does it mean to be able to teach? It means to be able to take the whole counsel of God and deliver it to God's people. Now, that doesn't mean I'm going to just skip around and preach the parts of the Bible that sound nice and are comfortable, and I like, but I have to teach it all. Even those parts that are hard and uncomfortable to hear, that step on the toes of the congregation, well, listen, they step on our toes too before we ever preach it. We have to give a full, complete diet of God's word because it's only through that kind of a diet that God's people will grow that they will grow deeper in their faith, grow stronger in their faith. And it must be God's teaching. It's not the teaching of the elder. It's not the teaching of the church. It's the teaching of God's word. That is what we have been charged to give, that and that alone. So we derive what we teach and preach from the words of Scripture. And the ministry of teaching For the elder also refutes and corrects error, especially from wolves who seek to devour the flock. Now third, Paul says in verse 6 that an elder must not be a recent convert. The work of the elder is no small task. It requires a tremendous amount of work. He teaches, he counsels, he leads, and he sets an example to the flock that he is called to serve. It doesn't require simply knowledge. It requires wisdom. It doesn't simply require a set of ethics that you ascribe to philosophically. It requires a pattern of behavior, ethical behavior, over time that you have demonstrated that what the transformation Jesus has brought into your life is real and that you are following it. We wouldn't put a child in charge of a group of people, would we? So we wouldn't put a new convert in charge of God's church either because they are young in the faith. The danger that is posed to those who are young in the faith if they're put into that kind of a position is conceit, pride. Listen, the office of elder comes with a certain amount of respect, a certain amount of of even prestige, if you want to say that. And the problem is that that can easily go to someone's head if they're not careful. In other words, they start believing their own hype. And that is a dangerous place for any believer to be in, but especially a believer who has been called to the office of elder. You have to be careful here. So Paul instructs Timothy to prevent that by not 
putting new converts into the office so that they might avoid the condemnation that comes with conceit. Now, the next relationship Paul highlights in this list is the relationship to the elder's family. And this is first noted back in verse 2. He's to be the husband of one wife. Now, perhaps no other qualification in this list has been more controversial than this one. What does it mean to be the husband of one wife? Well, in the Greek, it's literally a one-woman man. And over the years, this has generated a lot of debate. It's generated a lot of theories about what Paul meant by this. Some have argued that it was a condemnation and a prohibition against polygamy, that the elder should only have one wife, not two, three, seven, ten. Uh, he's not called to be Solomon. He is called to be the husband of one wife. The only issue with that is that polygamy was not particularly prevalent in Rome at this time. And it certainly was not an issue in the early church. We don't see anything about that, in fact. And nowhere else in Scripture do we see uh, in the New Testament Paul saying, don't have more than one wife. It's here. So that may not be the best explanation. Now, some have even said that this means that the uh, elder must be married, that a single man cannot be an elder. I don't think that's it either, because it's hard for me to believe that Paul would disqualify himself and Jesus from being elders in the church. So I don't think that that's it. Uh, some have even gone on to say he must be married with children because there's a uh, qualification about how he rules his household, but I think that that goes too far here. Some have said that it precludes anybody from the office who has a spouse who dies and then they remarry. But again, Paul in scripture says that second marriages after the death of one of the spouses are permissible. So if they're permissible, why would they be disqualifying here? And then there's what is perhaps the most common explanation, and that is that anyone who has been divorced at any point in their life is disqualified from serving as an elder. And this has some challenges with it as well. What about those believers who were divorced before they came to Christ? Are there sins to exclude them forever? from serving him if that is where God has called them? Uh, what about a biblically permissible divorce? What about a divorce where the uh, wife leaves the husband despite the husband's pleading and seeking after reconciliation? There's an example in our own time, a, a name that many of you know and probably love deeply, Charles Stanley, uh, the pastor in Atlanta, former Southern Baptist president. Uh, he had that kind of a situation. Did that disqualify him permanently from this? So there's a lot of things here. What I think that Paul is describing is a man whose singular devotion to the woman to whom he's married, if he's married, is like that of Christ for his bride, the church. He's willing to do whatever it takes for her. He is willing to lay down his life for her. He's willing to set aside his rights and his privileges and his desires for her. And he has no eyes for anyone else. This is not a man who is flirtatious with other women. He doesn't just, you know, jokingly flirt with, with other women. He's not constantly having a roaming eye where he's looking at them. It's, it's, it's a man who even an accusation of infidelity against would be laughable. That is a one-woman man. Now, if an elder candidate had a divorce in their background, I'm not saying that you just ignore it. By no means. That's a serious red flag for anybody who's vetting elders. You need to investigate that. The church needs to investigate it seriously and pay close attention to it. And, and when did it happen? Why did it happen? All of those kind of things. And if there is a disqualifying aspect to it, by all means, they don't meet the qualifications here. Don't put them in as an elder. But I do not believe that Paul intended to create another unforgivable sin in Scripture here in divorce. Now, the second aspect of the relationship to his family is found in verse 4. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. 
Paul is describing a man who, if he is a father, he has the respect of his family such that his family follows him, is submissive to him, follows his lead where he goes. This is not describing an authoritarian father who beats his wife and children into submission, whether with his hand or his words or emotional manipulation or anything like that. He keeps his family in submission. Yes, his children are submissive, yes, but it's submission out of love for him. It's submission out of his character for him. He provides loving leadership and direction for the family. He teaches and corrects them according to what Scripture teaches. And Paul draws a strong correlation here between the pastor's home and the church of God, the pastor's house and the house of God. He says that if a, if a man can't manage his own household well, then how can he manage the household of God? How can he manage the church so just as husbands and fathers are not to lead their families with an iron fist, elders are not supposed to rule the church in a domineering, heavy-handed manner. That is not it. You see, a servant leader elder leads the flock by demonstrating his compassion and care for the people he oversees. Now, the next relationship I want you to see is that of the elder's relationship to himself. In other words, his personal character. And we see the first of these in verse 2. He must be sober-minded. Now, some translations render this as temperance, and he's to be temperate. But that can sometimes be confused in our context today with being uh, in regards only to alcohol. And that's something that Paul discusses in a few minutes. I don't think he's repeating himself here. No, I think what Paul is describing is a man who is sober-minded. He has an attitude and a mindset towards the work that he has been called to do that is serious. He understands it's a high responsibility. He understands it is a great task at hand. It's a noble task, but it's a great task. And he is serious about the work that he has been called to do. He doesn't come to it flippantly or carelessly or impulsively or in a distracted manner. He takes the responsibility of the office seriously because he wants to glorify God in what he does. He wants to serve the people in the best way he can. Now, please don't mistake sober-minded with somber, okay? There, there, there can be a mistake that a pastor just must be serious all the time and never smile and never have any joy and never tell a joke unless it's in the sermon and, and he can never laugh and he can, he's got to be very serious. No, no, but being sober-minded means that the pastor knows when it's time to be serious and when it's time to joke around there's a time for every season, right? There's a time for every kind of word there. And so we must understand that when it comes to the business of the church, there's a time to be serious and sober-minded and not act impulsively. Now, second, he's also to be self-controlled, which means that he is not a man given to excess or extravagance. He is not going to be someone who is just, as soon as he gets an impulse, runs out and fulfills it. He is a man who is balanced in his priorities. He understands that there's a great many things that he needs to keep in balance and the priorities need to be where they belong. He keeps the main thing the main thing. The elder is the man who has learned by the grace of God to control his inward desires. He doesn't pursue every uh, whim that he has he submits his mind and his body to Jesus Christ in all things. Now, third, he's not a drunkard, as we see in verse 3. And again, some people have taken this and, and also the sober-minded to mean that, that a pastor is to be uh, a teetotaler, completely abstinent from alcohol. And I think that you have a hard time making that argument completely from Scripture, but you can make a great argument that a pastor should abstain from alcohol out of a wisdom move. That's absolutely a possibility here, and that's not a bad thing. You see, pastors 
if they don't believe that alcohol is inherently sinful, and some don't, if, if they believe that, then they have to be cautious because they are in Romans 14 in terms of some Christian liberty able to do that, but they are precluded from being a stumbling block to any other believer who may not believe the same thing and who may struggle with this question. So if there's a pastor who likes to have a glass of wine with his meal at home, okay. But if he goes out and he's at the bar and he throws back a couple with his buddies in front of everybody, that may not be the best witness in the community that that pastor can give. And so I think that we need to be very cautious here in this regard because we cannot, elders cannot, must not be stumbling blocks to anyone, not just believers in the church, but outsiders as well. Fourth, not only is he not to be a drunkard, he is not to be a lover of money there at the end of verse three. When elders are overly concerned with the accumulation of wealth and possessions, they are demonstrating a lack of trust in God's provision. They are elevating things above people and they are showing an absence of thankfulness for what they have. The love of money in the hearts of elders has created more temptations for them and more heartaches for the church than we can count. There are so many things. There's a reason why Paul would say in his letter to Timothy, for the love of money is the root of all evil. It's not money. It's the love of money. It's the desire. It's the chasing after it. It's the elevation of it as an idol in the life of the elder that is the root of all kinds of evil. And it is the same for believers as well. In Hebrews 13.5, we read, uh, how many of you have heard that wonderful passage from Hebrews? It's in other places too, but where Jesus says, I will never leave or forsake you. Oh, how wonderful a promise that is, amen? Guess where it comes at the end of this verse. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave nor forsake you. Do you see why that love of money in the heart of an elder is a absolute lack of trust in God's provision? Jesus has said, I will never leave or forsake you. You will have your needs met. You may not have all your wants met. You may not be the nicest house on the block. You may not drive the best car, but your needs will be met because I will never leave nor forsake you. Now, let me say at the same time, that doesn't mean that the church should treat elders like that one deacon prayed at a business meeting, Lord, you make them humble and we'll keep them poor. You see, if you're kept poor, you might stay humble, right? No, that's not the way that it is. And that's certainly not the way it is here. I, I don't want to infer that at all. But we need to make sure that the love of money in the life of an elder is not present. It can't be. So as we consider men as elders in the church, we must consider the evidence of their lives in how they chase after material wealth. Now the final relationship that Paul highlights here is the relationship between the elder and others. We see that he f must first be respectable. Respectable. The idea here is that he has personal characteristics that evoke admiration in others. When somebody considers the elder, whether it's someone in the church or outside the church, his personal characteristics, his internal dignity that had been molded by his walk with Jesus Christ is evidenced by how he lives out his faith every day. When he walks into a room, there's a dignity about him. It's not because of how he was bred, it's not because of his manners, it's because of his walk with Christ and how he has been transformed by the sanctification of the Holy Spirit. But second, he's also to be hospitable. Now it's important to remember the cultural context here. Hospitality was a very important aspect, a very highly valued trait in the society in which Paul was writing. Our culture 
on the other hand, has become more and more privatized. We close ourselves off more and more from other people. We retreat into our homes and we guard them jealously. And we do not want even our friends to come over all that much and certainly not strangers. But the elder is called to be hospitable. I would argue as well that Christians as a whole are called to be hospitable. They're to be welcoming to others. They're to demonstrate hospitable care to others. Again, in Hebrews 13, 2, we read, Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. You see, elders must be ready to open themselves and their homes up in order to minister not only to the flocks that they serve, but to strangers that God brings into their life as well, people who have needs. And they must take every opportunity to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Third, the elder is not violent but gentle. This doesn't mean that he is a weakling. It doesn't mean that he is effeminate. It doesn't mean that he is less than manly. But what it does mean is that he is not a bully. He is not the kind of person who will uh, be abusive to others. The picture here is of a man who lords his position over others. I'm the pastor. You're going to do what I say. I'm an elder. You have to do what I tell you to do. And they will use whatever means, even physicality, in order to achieve their ends because they are self-centered. Now, he may use various forms of abuse. It might be emotional, verbal, physical, sexual, to get his way. But the godly elder, in contrast, is willing to be gentle. He's flexible rather than rigid where flexibility is appropriate. He is willing to put others ahead of himself. He's forbearing with those who may not agree with him on every matter, and he's willing to understand that there are some issues that are first-order issues, and we cannot negotiate and we cannot compromise on them. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is God. The Trinity is real. There's salvation through Jesus Christ alone. These things we will not bend on. But there are others such as are you pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib, we can be flexible there. We can give some grace to others who may not believe exactly the way that we believe. We're gentle. Fourth, the elder is not quarrelsome. In other words, he's not an argumentative person. Now, this doesn't mean that he is not an advocate for the truth and that he doesn't engage in serious and even passionate discussions on the faith, but he is not a person who goes out looking for a verbal fight. He's not a person who's always seeking to find the fault in someone else in order to cover his own insecurities. He is not a man who is pugnacious. He is a man who is gentle. He will certainly hold firm on the faith and he will defend it. He is convinced of it but he's willing to teach rather than force it on anyone. And then finally, he's to be well thought of by outsiders. We see that in verse 7. You know, today the church faces the unbelievable challenge of elders who have abused their office. Some of the most horrific ways you can think of. They've embezzled from the church. They have uh, cheated on their taxes. They've been caught in immoral situations. They have abused children. And in every one of these cases and so many more because they have not lived up to the qualifications and the standards of, of being an elder as Paul lays out here, The credibility of the church and the credibility of the gospel have been damaged. They've been injured. How in the world can I stand here and tell you about the transformative power of the gospel, the gospel that brings life, when I don't demonstrate it in my life? When I act like all of these things I'm not supposed to be, when people outside the church says, that guy is nothing more than a hypocrite. Listen, if I stand here 
and preach the whole counsel of God. If I preach what the Bible says, I will open myself up and every other elder will open themselves up to, to mockery and charges of being a bigot or a misogynist or a homophobe or any other word, uh, probably the worst one of all, intolerant. Listen, if people have that opinion of me because I preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, so be it. But may elders never, never be not well thought of by outsiders because they don't live up to the qualifications that they have been called to, that they don't live differently than what they preach. May that never be said of us. Not only as elders, but brothers and sisters, may that never be said of any of us. Now, before we conclude this study of the standards of church leadership as it applies to elders, I think we should consider what the elders' ministry is composed of. How do we apply these things? How are these standards put into practice? Well, first of all, the elder is to be shepherding the congregation in the local church. In 1 Peter 5, 2, we read Peter's charge to elders. He says, shepherd the flock of God that is among you. You know, shepherds spend their whole lives with their flocks, don't they? They get to know their individual sheep. They know their proclivities. They know their needs. They know their quirks. They know all that there is to know about the sheep. And the sheep know the shepherd. They love the shepherd. There's a close relationship between them. Well, that's how it is supposed to be with pastor elders in the church. You see, though churches ordain elders, it is Christ who has called and equipped them to serve in this capacity. And who is Christ? The chief shepherd. He is the good shepherd. He is the one who has demonstrated for us how we are to lead the sheep. And, and when you look at that, we who have been called to be elders are to follow his example. We must be willing to lay our lives down for the sheep. A faithful shepherd will lead the sheep to sustenance. They'll feed the sheep. They'll go after the sheep that stray from the fold and they tend the flock. They'll be there in good times. Listen, when somebody has a baby, I love going up to the, Aaron and I love going up to the hospital and getting to hold that newborn infant. And I've gotten to do that for so many of you here in the church. Uh, it is a joy, right? Marriages, weddings, oh, what a joyful time that is. And I've had the privilege to, to oversee some of those and officiate some of those. And anniversaries, birthdays, any kind of celebration, isn't that joyful? Just going and visiting us. But we're also there in the difficult hard times. We're there in illness when people are in the hospital. We're there when there's a tragedy that has struck. We're there when death has come. That's what tending the flock means. It doesn't mean just being there for the good stuff. It means being there for all things. But second, the elder provides oversight. We continue in 1 Peter 5, 2. He says that the elders are to be exercising oversight. And we discussed earlier what that means, but I want us to consider how the elder does that in the context of a plurality of elders. If there's one elder, it's easy to do that. But when you've got multiple elders, how does that work? Well, it works very simply. You see, those of us who have been called to this position as elders are elders. We don't see in scripture super elders, more elder than other elders or anything like that. I can tell you that here at Faith Baptist Church, among the elders, I am an elder. Now, I hold the title of senior pastor. I'm in vocational ministry. I'm, I'm employed by the church. We understand that, but I am one voice one vote amongst the elders. I can tell you in the nearly five years that I have had the joy and the pleasure of serving this church in that capacity, that we have never had a major disagreement amongst the elders. Not even one. Praise God for that. That's by his grace alone, okay? But we've had disagreements. 
We've had differences of opinions. What do we do? We trust one another. We know that each one of us has been called and equipped from God and that we have a different perspective. And sometimes we may not see everything as well as we ought to see. I'm thankful for my brother elders who have helped me over time and I'm sure I have helped them over time as well. And in the end, if the other elders follow what I propose, it's not because I'm a super elder, it's because I have led with integrity and demonstrated these qualifications to them in the life that I have lived before them that they trust my following of God's will. Third, elders are to be examples to members of the church. In 1 Peter 5, 3, the apostle goes on to explain that elders are not to be domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. An elder must never be a do as I say, not as I do leader. You can't do that as an elder. The flock will not follow. And Paul says the same thing in 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. These characteristics that are laid out in 1 Timothy 3 should be found in every Christian, but elders have the responsibility of modeling them to the congregation, to live them out, to be these things. It's an axiom that members of a particular church will resemble those men who lead them. If you have a pastor who is legalistic, the church will be legalistic. The people in the pews will be legalistic. If you have a pastor who preaches and teaches that scripture is unreliable, the congregation will always seek pragmatism over God's plan. That's just the way it goes. That's why it is so important for elders to live up to these qualifications that we find here. You see, all elders are examples. All of them are. The question is, are they good ones? Are they good examples or bad? Listen, being a Christ-like example is hard work. It requires much grace from God and from other people. But it is what we are called to be. Now, fourth, the elders have a responsibility for teaching in the local church. We see that in our passage, as well as in 1 Timothy 1.9, where Paul said, he must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine. How many churches today are weak and anemic because the elders of that church have watered down the word of God to the point that it is nothing? How sad that is for the church today. Elders are responsible for teaching sound doctrine, and that means they must be learning it themselves. Listen, the day that an elder is ordained is not the day that he ceases to learn. It is the day that he really digs in. He has to. An elder must delve deep into the mysteries of God. He must wrestle with them. He must learn them. He must apply them in his own life, and then he must teach them to the congregation. That is what the responsibility of the elder is. One of the great deceits our enemy has foisted on the churches today is that people will not tolerate doctrinal preaching. The people just want relevant preaching. Brothers and sisters, there is nothing more relevant to you in your life today than the great doctrines of the faith. Nothing. Because that is what is going to help you to meet the needs that you see. The great doctrines of the faith don't teach you that you can do it by yourself. They don't teach you that you're strong enough and good enough and doggone it, people like you. What the doctrines of the church teach us today is that we all need Christ. And not only do we all need Christ, we always need Christ in every moment. And finally, perhaps most controversially, Elders must correct and rebuke false teaching. Let me continue from Titus 1, 9 through 11. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction and in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, 
especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced since they are upsetting uh, families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. If you've been around here for any length of time, you know that, that I am not hesitant to call out not only false teaching for what it is, but those who promote it. I don't relish that. I don't like it. I am not a confrontational person by nature. I hate it. But I cannot allow false teaching to infiltrate God's church and destroy his people. False teaching is cancer in the body of Christ. And it will consume the flock if you don't identify it, point out why it's wrong, and stand firm against it. And as we near the day when Christ returns, false teachers will come into the church more and more and more, trying to deceive God's people, trying to deceive his own and lead people down the path of death and destruction. We who are elders must resolve all the more to stand firm for the truth of the faith, protecting the families of God's church, because anything less would be a dereliction of duty. That's it. And needless to say, the work of an elder is a noble task, and it's a consuming one. So this morning, I want to challenge you in the coming days to pray for the elders here at Faith Baptist Church, those who are active and those who are on sabbatical right now. Pray for them. Lift them up because the burdens that they carry are heavy. Pray for the elders of our sister churches here in Battle Creek, here in Michigan, here in the United States, all around the world because it's not any easier for them. In many cases, it's incredibly difficult, the pressures that they face, the burdens that they carry. I would also encourage you to pray for those whom God is preparing to serve in the office of elder. See, God is calling people to serve him. Pray for them and pray for the advance of the gospel because of the service of faithful elders who have been called to teach and proclaim the only source of life that there is in this world, the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you're here this morning and you don't know him, if you have not experienced Jesus, then I'm going to be right down here. I'm, in fact, I'm going, to, I'm going to stand right down here as we sing our closing hymn. I know we're supposed to social distance, but listen, if you are feeling God's call, if you're feeling the Holy Spirit call to you and say, I need to know Jesus. I realize I can't do this on my own. I need him. Then come down here and talk to me. If you need to stand six feet away, that's fine. But don't feel like you have to. Get closer to me. I'm happy to, to share the gospel with you this morning and tell you about the love of Christ for you and the salvation that can be had in his name. Will you join me in prayer? Our gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for how you have designed your church. Father, it seems many times like foolishness, and there are many who in the world would say there are much better and more effective and more efficient ways to organize leadership and to do things. But Father, your word has already given us the way that you have designed it. If we would just be faithful in following it. Father, we know that the proclamation of the gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who hear the message of salvation in it, it is life. Father, I thank you that this morning we could celebrate that new life through the baptisms of Jesse and Tara. Oh, what a joy that was. Father, I pray this morning for those who are here who may not yet know you, that, Father, they would see their great need for salvation, turn from their sin, and follow you. 
We ask this in the mighty, saving name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.